Hey, y'all. Welcome. Welcome back to Interstage Window, my Saturday stream, which is with my friends. And I have here today with me, Landon. Say hi, Landon. Hi, Landon. Oh, my gosh. Landon, look at this background. Look at the, the, the little Gryffindor colors of the names. Oh, my God. What are we talking about today? So good. It's Harry Potter and the Deathly Hollows, Y'all, we made it. We have made it. <sighs> this has been... I think we're we're at a year and a half in the making. Yeah, it's taken a year and a half. Series. And we're not over yet. We're going to have two parts, just like the other, the last few, mm -hmm. uh, plus a fandom episode, mm -hmm. and then maybe some Fantastic Beasts and where to find them. I mean, just like the Harry Potter series ends with an absolutely disgustingly awful epilogue, you can come to us for a disgustingly awful epilogue stream. So yes. there will be a few more Harry Potter streams. Yes. Um, but yeah, we're, we're actually nearing the end. We're on the last book. Uh, my mind is kind of blown. So before we get into it, uh, before we actually like go to the slideshow and all of that, <laughs> I just want to say like, this has been an absolutely like beautifully cathartic experience going through the books one by one with you. Um, and, and not just with Landon, but with all of you guys in our community that come to these streams, as well as those that watch the VODs on YouTube, um, it has been a, a very, um, a very uh, mentally, emotionally, spiritually cleansing experience for me. Um, and that is despite the fact that J.K. Rowling recently tweeted the tweet that has in, inside, and it's not her worst tweet, but it's the one that upset me the most inside that where she said, fuck you, I sleep on piles of money. That's not a direct quote, but that's basically what she said. That's what she said. Um, that's what I read. So, so yeah. So, so even though all of that, it has been very healing for me to go through these as an adult and come to an understanding myself yeah. of why the books mean so much to me while also recognizing that like, I was a kid and objectively they're not that good. And I can reconcile those two things now in a way that I was not able to before. So thank you, everybody. And also, it's just been really fun being able to like tear something that I love dearly to shreds and sit there and say, this is why fandom is better. Why is that so fun? Why is it so it's fun so bitching fun. about the things that you like? It's so fun. <laughs> because the reality is, is that like, this is the thing that I've gotten older. Harry Potter, liking Harry Potter, I am convinced is part of my brand as a human being. Mm. I'm not even sure I like it anymore. <laughs> I'm pretty <laughs> sure I don't actually, but I'm just like, man, I have so much sunk cost into liking Harry Potter that I have to continue to find reasons to like it. <laughs> and being able to tear it apart and sit there and be like, this is like the media of it all. And this is like the writing style. And this part means that I can still enjoy it. Mm, mm. We can enjoy it in our, um, in our own uh, destructive <laughs> ways. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we're bought in at this point. Okay. True. I mean, mistakes were made, but those were in the past and we were children. But yeah, okay, let's actually get started. Let me show let me show you guys this beautiful deck. Here we go. Look at this. We, wow. We amped it up. We were like, man, it's the last book. We're not yeah. gonna have that boring deck that we've been having for six straight books. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> oh my gosh, hugs for you too, Anime Girl Super Kawaii. I love Hello. you so much. Thank you for <gasps> joining us today. I'm um, so glad she's been coming more and more often. It's been so nice to see her. Yes, yes. Is is your pronoun she? By the way, your name is kind oh, yes, of gen reads so a little gender neutral to me. Well, I I don't I don't know. They might have told us and I've forgotten. So if that happened, I'm sorry. But if you could tell us your pronouns, um, actually, I realized I do not know them. <laughs> but yeah, we're gonna talk about Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. This is gonna be a two part stream as we've been doing for the last books because they're quite meaty and there's a lot of stuff we want to talk about. Yes. So um, we're gonna be doing it this week and we are gonna be talking about Deathly Hallows next week as well so make sure you come for part two of this too but yeah um anything else before we before we kind of get into it landon i don't think so i think that we should start off with how we start off every harry potter stream mm. and that's by reminding our fans and we kind of already touched on it that this episode of interchange window will contain spoilers for the harry potter series we are not spoiler free this book has been out for over 10 years at this point uh, and everything else in the extended wizarding world universe is 
up for grabs, especially the books that we have read, but also everything else that we are taking. We're taking from Pottermore. We're talk talking about other things too. So if you do not like spoilers, this is not the stream for you. If you don't care, you're welcome. Please stay. It's going to be a riot. Yes, absolutely. Um, also, we do not agree with pretty much everything J.K. Rowling has tweeted in the past few years. If you kind of go from about the point that she talked about wizards shitting themselves to the present, not much we agree with. Uh, no. You know, so uh, for the Harry Potter streams, as we always like to say, uh, if you would like to support us, you are welcome to if you would like to, but a better way would be to actually give that money to an organization like the Trevor Project. Um, they need it, especially the ones in the UK, uh, where living as trans is even worse than it is yes. here. So. Uh, support your trans youth because it is incredibly important. Uh, one and four uh, trans kids will end up committing suicide. So yep. please support your trans youth. Uh, and also know that this stream, like many of the other Harry Potter streams, we're going to talk about things like abuse. We're going to talk about things like uh, sexual sexuality and flagging that and and anti-Semitistic rhetoric from our <laughs> from J.K. Rowling. Uh, mm. We're going to talk about all the bad, the dirty, the terrible. Uh, and so we're going to obviously don't agree with anything that she is saying. Uh, but those are topics that are going to come up and that we're going to talk freely about. So please be aware of that as we move forward. All right. All right. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let's get into it. So we start off every stream with asking what is our favorite things about this thing? So Karen, what is your favorite thing about Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows? Okay, so I have to talk about one of my favorite things. There are many in this book, okay? But one of my favorite things is Xenophilius and the whole storyline with the Quibbler, okay? There is a lot in Harry Potter that I think it shows that J.K. Rowling did not do research about um, how fascism emerges within a liberal democracy, okay? However, the way that Xenophilius is treated, I actually think is very realistic, okay? Because if you think about like our world, right? You can only be so like left leaning in the press, but you can be a little bit, okay? Like you can sprinkle it in here and there. John Oliver is a fantastic example of that, right? He is quite left leaning, okay? And no one's really, I mean, I'm, I'm sure he has haters, right? And security or whatever, but no one's really going after John Oliver. But I can easily see a world where he's getting farther and farther left and then he is attacked. And that's basically what well, happens to Zeno. They, I mean, they did like when Trump was president. Oh, they hated uh, him. There was, and there was so much uh, lawsuits being thrown at the, at yeah. the John Oliver show. So like, yeah. obviously that's different than necessarily what happens in Xenophilius, but in the no one's, ki no society, one's kidnapping, kidnapping John Oliver's family, but you know, no, but <laughs> there could be a world in which, if the government had more power and were able to do it in a legal way without suffering repercussions, I could see that happening with certain leaders yes, uh, that yes. are running for president in our democracy currently. And and that's and in in the wizarding world, we have a situation where they have a, a total coup of the government. Yep. You know, um, they come in, uh, Voldemort installs his specific people, right? So now they are free to actually go after Zeno, and all of a sudden. He is um, vulnerable in a way that he wasn't before. And I think his reaction to uh, sacrifice his morals and integrity for his daughter is incredibly real. I think truly that is what most people would do in that situation. And, uh, and my heart really goes out to him. We only get a little bit of him in the books and in the movies. But this scene in particular where they go to his house and Zeno is kind of like, trying to figure out like, okay, how do I keep them here so I can get Luna back? Like the performance is just amazing also it, on top I, of it being really well, uh, well done in the books. I also feel that it's very accurate to uh, the form of like what happens when someone like, cause you have so much of these books are like, oh, you need one person to stand up against a, uh, a government that is like corrupt so thinking yeah. games, thinking, <laughs> like thinking like that is a YA sort of like the chosen one concept and this is mm. like 
exactly the chosen one. There is one person that needs to stand up to the corrupt being. Mm. But throughout this book, we see the consequences of people who are also standing up. So it's not like how it was earlier in the series where Harry is the only person standing up and therefore the only person being punished. We're watching other people stand up and not be able and, and suffer the consequences of those. So it feels more real. It feels more like, oh, this is not just because no one will do anything. It's that no one can do anything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And there is like a level yes. of realism there. Yeah. It's like, it's not that people don't try. It's yeah. that they don't have the power they don't have the ability to, or, or yeah. they do. And then all of a sudden their daughter gets kidnapped and all, yeah. and then it's like, okay, do I protect me and myself or do I continue to do what I am trying to do while sacrificing my life and my child's life, which is, mm -hmm. I mean, very reminiscent of a lot of world war two things that were happening in Nazi Germany and under. Fascism. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, there were lots of people in, um, in the countries that uh, Germany went and conquered that were resisting and, and were standing up to them and, and things like that. Um, and they were punished. They were punished in, in some of very similar ways to what happens to Xenophilius and worse. Yeah. So it is, it's a nice, like, Oh, this is actually feels real and feels like it could be what it is. <laughs> yeah. It feels real. It, um, it gets me every time. Basically it's one of those moments in the books that um, even though we do not know Zeno very well, it doesn't matter. Um, his story is compelling, even with the little bit that we know about him. Well, it's also like shows. I personally choose not to believe that JKR got a, to be a better writer for this book uh, because she's then <laughs> gone on and proved that she isn't a better writer. Um, so the amount of editing that has existed in this book and the amount of like contributes from editors and possibly other writers uh, that really go into like showing those small moments where like Xenophilius is dancing with his daughter at a wedding where you see the see the before so even though we barely know him we still feel something mm -hmm. there is there is a level of a lot of that hidden a lot of these subtle background characters have rich histories and backstories that exist just in this book yeah and it's really that's cool. true yeah for sure so this is one of my favorite things in the book. Um, I just I love this little this little subplot. I think it's uh, it adds a lot of intrigue and um, and it, it makes me want, want more Zeno, you know. <laughs> so that's my favorite thing. But uh, for this week, Landon, what is your favorite thing? Man, Rita Skeeter's The Life and Lies of Albus Dumbledore. Uh, you have our favorite heard, bug bay. <laughs> our favorite bug bay. You have heard it from the very beginning that I am an anti Dumbledore stan. I have, I am team Dumbledore is as evil as Voldemort. I am team Dumbledore is a manipulative little son of a bitch. And I have been wanting for years in the fandom as well as in these books for Harry to see the danger and destruction Dumbledore has caused by his manipulations. And we get that in this book. Now it's a race because Dumbledore overall is like, you know, above all and worthy of being the leader of the wizarding world. But we see like the amount of raising a pig for slaughter Dumbledore truly has treated in Harry by not giving Harry any access to himself and his life and the inequity of power that Harry didn't know existed. And as we watch Harry discover more and more about Dumbledore, he's discovering more and more that he did not know this man that he is, that he is basically killing himself for. Uh, because Harry has not necessarily been stop the world. It is stop the world because this is what I've been told to do by Dumbledore. Yes. Yes. And so. if you, if you liked anything that Landon said, you should definitely come back in December when we have our Fantastic Beasts episode, because so we'll be talking a lot more about all of those points that she just introduced. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. So yeah, um, I would agree. I think this is an excellent part of the book. Um, I like, they went on to create a lot of like spinoff books based on books that it lived, that existed in Harry Potter. So like, for example, um, Fantastic Beasts, they, they created that actual textbook, Quidditch Through the Years, that's an actual book. You know, there's a few of these examples, right? This one doesn't exist in the real world. Wish it did. 
in a way. So cool. Kind of glad it doesn't in another way. <laughs> uh, I haven't found a fan fiction yet for it, but if somebody knows one, I would love to read this book like as a fan fiction because I think Wouldn't it would be, be awesome. Great. I think it'd be so good. So if someone has a really good Rita Skeeter voice out there that writes fic, um, yeah, yeah, hit us up, let us know. So right. yes, these are our favorite things. Um, we're going to talk more about this book in a moment, but before we do, we want to get everybody up to speed in case it's been a minute since you've read them, um, which is totally understandable. So it is plot summary time. Landon is going to walk us through the major story beats of what happens in Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. All right, Landon, take it away, my friend. So first of all, I gotta say, it's been a while since we've done this because Karen's been taking out the Sailor Moon ones, which is our last few media episodes. Second of all, there's so much that happens in this book. And (sighs) unlike some books in the past, all of it is important. So I apologize for the novel I'm about to read you. Oh God, uh, I just saw it. I just saw your phone <laughs> well, screen. I the, you keep scrolling. It's, it's not, it's not a, they can't see it. Scoot it a little oh. closer to your face. Oh my God. <laughs> That's hard. All right. <laughs> I'm, I'm ready. Okay. I got my tea right here. Settle I got some in. strawberry tea in my strawberry cupcake cup. Um. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. Settle in Regale boys me. and girls and <laughs> days and thems. We start where we began. Number four, Privet Drive, as Harry says goodbye to the relatives that abused him all his life. Harry makes a great escape with the Order of the Phoenix, but they are ambushed, betrayed by one of their own. Uh, In a great chase for their life, Harry and his friends must outrun Death Eaters while flying over the British countryside. Hedwig and Mad-Eye Moody are the first victims of this novel, and George becomes holy and loses an ear. The aftermath of tragedy settles as a wedding preparations begin at the burrow. Harry, Ron, and Hermione are bestowed gifts from Dumbledore's will. Harry is given his first snitch, as well as the uh, sword of Gryffindor, which he is denied access to. Ron, a contraption that looks familiar to the readers, but not to Ron himself. And Hermione, a book with a weird symbol in it. All three are left confused and without direction, as is much of this book. At the wedding, the ministry falls. Chaos ensues and the trio begins their escape. Grimbald Place becomes a sanctuary where they learn that the first few steps of defeating Voldemort. R.A.B., the locket that they had discovered the previous year, belonged to Regulus Black. And the locket they need has actually been thrown at the very house that they're st- thrown out of the very house that they are staying in. Uh, after kin- kidnapping Menungus Maine, Uh, they discover that Dolores Umbridge now possesses the locket that they need. And in a 1950s heist movie style, the trio infiltrates the ministry and rescues Muggleborn from prosecution and steals the locket back. But in the process, they lose Grimald Place, thus starting the never-ending camping trip. The trio travels to the countryside, desperate for news, cut off from the world, and with no clear direction of where to go or what to do. The only answers lies in the one of the books that they have, The Tales of Beetle the Bard, with its story of the three brothers and death. Tensions rise, and the locket, which feeds on the vitriolic anger of each of our heroes, tears the friends apart. And after an explosive fight, Ron leaves and doesn't come back. Harry and Hermione bond together, spending Christmas at Harry's home in, in Godric's Hollow, uh, with the possessed body of Mathilda Bagshot, who nearly kills them secretly being Nagini. They escape with a copy of Rita Skeeter's newest book, The Life and Lives of Albus Dumbledore. And as the duo cope with the abandonment and loneliness, they read their books and try to figure out where to go and what to do. Eventually, hope comes in the form of a Patronus, a doe that leads Harry to the sword of Gryffindor buried beneath an ice pond. He dives in as the locket is desperate to let him drown, but a miracle happens as he's pulled out, rescued by Ron, who has returned. They use the sword and destroy the locket. Hermione isn't nearly as forgiving as Harry for Ron's abandonment, and they travel to Xenophilius' love goods house. He tells them of the three objects that master death, the cloak of invisibility, the wand of power, and the stone of resurrection. He then betrays them as they discover that Luna has been taken hostage. There isn't time to process or heal their wounds as the trio is captured by the Snatchers. Unsure of, of what they have to do, 
Uh, if, or if they're hairy or not, the Snatchers take them to Malfoy Manor where Hermione is tortured and the other two thrown in a prison where they discover the prisoners in the basement. Uh, after the help of Wormtail and Dobby, Dobby comes to the rescue in the nick of time, but not before Bellatrix throws a knife and kills the free elf, taking another innocent life. Harry hurries, uh, Harry buries him by hand and the goblin grip hook takes notice in Harry's kindness. He offers information of a cup in a bank vault and offers the expertise to break into Green Gotts if they use the sword to pay him. But betrayal is everywhere as the trio grabs the cup, escapes the bank on dragon back and is flown to the countryside. The Horcrux, another Horcrux is destroyed. But Harry has a vision of the wand of power being used by Voldemort on the on the grounds of Hogwarts. So they rush to Hogwarts where war ensues. In a chaotic battle, Harry discovers many truths that Severus Snape had saved his life all along because of the love he had for his mother, that Harry must die willingly because of the Horcrux that lives inside of him. And in a goodness of power and a true Jesus resurrected moment, Harry sacrifices his life, meets Dumbledore in the afterlife where Dumbledore gives him the choice to live or not. He chooses to come back to fight the good fight. Nagini is destroyed. Severus Snape is dead. And eventually love over overcomes all in the last and final battle of good versus evil. And then we ignore the 19 years later where Harry is a wizard cop and has a family <laughs> and... It ends there. There is no epilogue. <laughs> there is no ending. <laughs> they don't stop the wand. They don't do anything that the movie was stupid enough to do. That's the end. <laughs> uh, I feel like I just went on the ride all over again. Listen, I there is nothing in there that wasn't important. <laughs> yeah, and we even there's even um, some things I noticed that we didn't mention. Like there's so many deaths, so many in this book um, that we're just gonna have to talk about later. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. All of the people died. Everybody. <laughs> um, so but that's many. the basic of what happened. We'll give little details and hints along the way. But basically, there are two books, three objects, seven horcruxes, three heroes, and a lot of people died. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. So if you didn't remember, now you can. That's what happens in Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. Let's start with the good yes okay man my favorite my favorite moment of this is that karen and i have planning meetings every time we read a book to discuss what it is we want to talk about and karen goes this book is so good <laughs> yeah it really is it is like, <laughs> i had not reread this book in so long um and there's reasons why it gets a lot of hate that we'll talk about that are super oh, yeah. valid but like there's a couple of reasons that this book is one of the better ones in the Harry Potter series. And um, and let's let's talk about that first one. We can show that show that first little picture. <gasps> so they have left Hogwarts in this book, and it kind of forces the book to go into a different direction so that it's not quite the same as the others. So it's very like refreshing in that way and it gets a lot of hate for like the the never-ending camping trip okay but I have a take here okay I have a take here about why I think people say that people that said that before the movies came out I think what they were really trying to say is the only thing I liked about this book was the fantasy of going to wizard school and I don't actually like anything else about it which is valid because these books are not that good so if that's the only thing you liked, yeah, this book ain't going to be that good. If you don't care about Harry, Ron, and Hermione, this book ain't going to be that good. But the truth is they needed to come out of Hogwarts if the book actually wanted to depict the heavy subject matter that it wanted to depict. Yes. So I think this is actually a good thing in these books. There's a shift from plot is king where... The, th the thing things that happen are the most exciting to characters are king mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. character development takes a front seat in this novel and really pushes things over obviously having just read the plot a lot happens but a lot happens and all of that is contributed to character growth that we see throughout the entire novel for multiple reasons one 
Harry has to be ready to be able to kill himself by the end of this novel. Like there is a lot of reasons why we have to see that character growth. But like that is the main reason for all of this. And I, that only was going to happen if they didn't go to Hogwarts. Like we couldn't have had we couldn't have had the transformations with the with the trio. We couldn't have had um the whole thing with uh with like the the wizarding radio. We couldn't have had, you know, all of these different plot lines of understanding what's going on with the adults in the series. Like yeah. that couldn't have happened if the golden trio went to Hogwarts. It couldn't the, have. Yeah, the isolation of of what it is to be out in the war the ability to like have to problem solve so much of their world revolved around school including the like the timing and beats of a series Mm -hmm. the most successful books of the series really traditionally followed a school year beat where it was like oh this thing happens on Halloween, this thing happens on Christmas, this thing happens over Easter break, and then the week before school is out, something big happens. Like, there is a plot line that is followed every holiday because we're in school. With this, there's, 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 a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a summer wedding, and we don't know time at all. Until they do Christmas. mention that Christmas. Yeah, we, we they do don't mention know, Christmas. We don't know time at all until Christmas Day. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, and that's put in there as a acknowledgement of the loneliness and isolation. Because Harry and Hermione don't realize it's Christmas until they hear the choir singing on Christmas Eve. And if you and if you are used to those beats, you can see why reading this final book, you would feel like oh, this is just meandering. When the heck are they going to do something else? They're just camping and camping and camping and camping. But that's not really true. And then I have another take on why people hate this, okay? I think most of the hate actually came after the movies came out. The truth is, in the movies, they kind of are just camping for forever and ever and ever and ever and ever, okay? Certain things are stretched out in the movies so that they can have the first movie end on Dobby's death, which is, if you look at the beats of the story, where the first movie should have ended if they're going to make two movies. Like, yes. I agree with that decision. But it causes them to stretch certain things. Um, and, and we'll talk about this a little bit later. Uh, we do have a, a book versus movie thing where I'm going to get into this more specifically. Um, so it causes them to stretch things. And then again, in the in the second movie, it causes them to stretch so much of the Battle of Hogwarts, which is a double-edged sword. Right. So when you so you feel like when you watch the first movie, you're just camping and camping and camping and camping and camping and waiting for the Battle of Hogwarts to freaking get here already. And and then it lasts like majority of the second movie. Um, And and then like once it gets here, it's like it lasts forever. Right. So I really think that most of the hate for the pacing comes from the movie one or two people that really the only thing they liked about Harry Potter was the fantasy of going to Hogwarts. I 100% agree with you. And yeah. we don't want to go into the movies too much because, yeah, like Karen said, we have a whole whole subsubject for next episode on book versus movie. Mm-hmm. But I think that this made this story, the idea of leaving Hogwarts, so much better. Couldn't have had Snatchers. It, it couldn't have couldn't had... Have had... Couldn't, have, couldn't have had learning about... Uh, we couldn't have the Xenobelius. We couldn't nope, have we couldn't had... Have had that. We couldn't have had the whole part with um with Ted Tonks and uh, and and Dean and them and and those goblins. We couldn't have had that. Like and, we couldn't have had so many things that are really good in this book. And Harry has been struggling with the powers that be at school for six books. Mm-hmm. He struggled with Snape as a teacher in the first book. He struggled with not having power or ownership with Lockhart as the second book. He struggled with like watching Remus suffer and also watching like he was completely un- like completely exposed and also like unable to do anything with Sirius Black. Uh, continue like the, the truly like denial of, of gaslighting him during the fifth book. Like we have watched him struggle with the power struggle at school for six books. If we were going to make it bigger, it couldn't have been this. It couldn't have been that same power struggle. Like it would have felt. You, it would have felt weak. Even it would have if you found so a way, yeah. Even if you found a way for him to learn about the Horcruxes, even if you found a way for him to learn about uh, the Deathly Hollows, like it just would not have. It would have been about Hogwarts. It wouldn't have been about the war. 
And in order to feel the war, they had to be out in it, even if they weren't yeah. actively fighting it. Yes, exactly. You better pet that kitty cat, by the way. You better I'm pet trying. that kitty cat, Landon. He's, I had. He needs I had, pets. I'm trying to give him a pet. Uh, <laughs> I had. I had a. Uh, some some uh buffalo wings and so he really he likes he's not supposed to have them he, but he likes the bones and i don't oh. know but he steals them he steals them oh. all the time so he's like i know what that smell is bad kitty <laughs> bad kitty bad kitty so yes right. okay leaving hogwarts it's a good thing actually that's the point yeah we're ready we're ready yeah. to leave that nest mm -hmm, mm -hmm. second good thing is the character development you guys Ron especially, but like the dynamics of the golden trio in this book are like, they're so good. And I know that like, this is not a new idea. She obviously stole the one ring, um, you know, that trope from, from Lord of the Rings. Like it's the same freaking thing, but it doesn't matter because it's Ron and Harry and Hermione dealing with the one ring. And I want to read about that. Okay. Yeah. And it was great. It was great to see that like, okay, Ron get some hate, especially movie Ron. He but, does not deserve it. But he does not deserve it because you know what? That's how I would be if I had to wear the one ring too, okay? And so I can look at Ron and I can sympathize and I can say, yeah, you know what? I get hangry too, Ron. I also need eight hours of sleep, friend, okay? It's just, it's great what he goes through, the, the way that they have everyone react to him. Like, it's very realistic and it's very cathartic when he does come back and is like, guys, I do want to help. I just lost my shit, but I'm here now. Like, it's, it's good. I love it. I think it just also speaks to the, like, because the, like, so obviously this Horcrux plays off of trauma. It plays off mm -hmm. of whatever trauma you have. Mm -hmm. So for Harry, his trauma is so substantial that yes he there's a difference but there isn't really a difference because he's constantly living in his trauma the other thing is too is that like living in this environment harry has been starved his whole life he's yeah. been malnourished he's been lonely he's had to live in the uncomfortable situations ron has never had to deal with that at all his trauma is coming from feeling inferior to the other people around him and then all of a sudden there's this thing whispering in his ear telling him that he is inferior. And it's like mm -hmm. that voice that can't shut up. And then on top of it, he's dealing with new things that he doesn't know how to deal with and new trauma. So he's not only being traumatized by the things that are currently traumatizing him. He's also now being traumatized by the things in the past. Like there, he, there's so much more trauma happening to Ron than the other two in this moment, which is like weird to say, but the other two know how to survive it. It's true. It's exactly what's happening. Like he's get, he's lacking sleep. He's not eating. And he's constantly being told your friends that you think are better than you. Guess what? They agree. And they're right. Like, and how people, would that feel? And people are like, well, Ron, well, Hermione and Harry are going through the same thing. Harry's been going through that his entire life. He has the coping mechanisms to be able to, to go against that and fight that. And mm -hmm. Hermione at the same time has had that sort of like buffer where she we don't necessarily know that she's been hungry and everything like that as she, like to the extent of harry but because of who she is and what we do know of her background of having to like fight through she has the things developed to to fight what they're fighting Ron doesn't well she's have she's been going she's been going through it for the past six years being um a, a, a you know a muggle born going to yeah. hogwarts like so so she has some defense mechanisms built up already because she's been practicing now for six years um whereas ron hasn't ron and that hasn't is, had to had to do anything and that is like a level of privilege like if you want to like break it down to what it is absolutely but it doesn't make it any worse it actually makes it that his like character growth is by far the best mm -hmm. and so people who hate on ron in this book i get so angry at because i think ron's character development is perfect and beautiful and wonderful the fact that he comes back the fact that he realizes his mistake the fact that he like never actually goes like home that he's constantly searching for them it's really. good it's so good yeah so ron haters don't interact mm -mm. <laughs> do not interact this is a this is a ron stan stream <laughs> <laughs> yes we stand book seven ron okay we do uh, he's so good. Yes. And I, and I definitely, when it, when it comes to this book, 
out of the three, I identify with him the most. And I think that that's for me, that that's not necessarily true in other books. In most of the other books, I identify a lot more with like what Hermione goes through with trying to learn about how to be confident and feminine at the same time and things like that. Uh, But in this book, it's totally flipped like Ron. I identify with Ron so much. When I think of the reality is, is that we would all be a Ron because we're not the chosen ones. Like there is so much like shit about being like the, the fact that they decided to highlight the character that is secondary, that is constantly supporting the chosen one in a way that isn't like blind, like very Samwise Gamgee, where it's like, I will do anything for you, Mr. Photo. Like that, that there is a struggle there is I think more realistic than anything else because none of us would be the chosen people. We would be the people that would be forced to like walk side by side with that person well, because there and, aren't really chosen people in real exactly, life. It's like, it's yes. not like that. It's not and like su- that. Yeah. And stuff. But like, that's the, that's the point. Like that he's the mm-hmm. everyman in this situation to suffer the consequences, to have to make the sacrifices and not get any of the glory. Yeah. The golden trio themselves, they are there. It's great. It, it's, it's really good. Um, how much time we get with them because we've always gotten lots of time with Harry but it depend depending on the book we don't always get a lot of time and real interactions in regards to Ron and Hermione especially in the early books with Hermione um you know you know in in book one two three and four I think all the way until like Harry really hits puberty he is uh he's quite mean towards Hermione (laughs) so and uh and and he doesn't like his inner dialogue about Ron isn't always much better. Yeah, great. So, <laughs> so it is very nice. Um, well, this and then- book, you don't, you don't get all of that meanness mm-hmm. with Harry. Um, so you actually get to really see the way Ron and Hermione truly are how I, I feel like. And then also with character development, you get the opportunity to have all the side characters develop. Mm-hmm. in this we have albus dumbledore development that we as the audience are finally let in on the life and minds of albus dumbledore we have so many of these small snippets of side characters luna like, like luna xenophilius yeah. lovegood uh you hear there's great character development as subtle as it is with wormtail my mm-hmm. absolute favorite and i'm about to get hate for it you ready my absolute ready. favorite character development remus fucking lupin Ooh, tell us more. Oh, oh my Lupin. gosh. Hey, Lunar. You are Hi, here. Lunar. You are here. You're on cue. You know what? You summoned her with werewolf talk. Let's talk. Uh, tell tell me. Tell me the Remus take. So we only know Remus at this point in time from Harry's perspective of the adult who is suffering from society, but has his shit together and is always making the correct decisions, who is suffering for being right, mm-hmm. right? And being good. War happens, things are scary. This boy man who is still, who has gone through so much trauma that he is so traumatized that he is processing things like a boy, sees a moment where he can live his glory, save the world, and also not ruin or destroy with his own internal fear of being dirty and unclean. Mm. This innocent child's life that he has created. So all of a sudden he's married. His wife is pregnant. They're going to have a baby. He is so full of self-hate that he thinks that he is going to destroy this life before it's even born. And then there's an opportunity to go and save the world, to do something good, even if it means that you die, even if it means that you abandon your kid, even if it means that you are doing the wrong thing you're doing it for the right reason and that's so much easier and so much better and so much braver quote unquote than stick it around and we never get to see this version of remus until this book but this version of remus is true this is the version of remus that is friends with characters like sirius and james and and wormtail like this is true gryffindor behavior and people hate it but it's amazing Yes. Oh my God. Okay. Okay. So many things. Yes. One hundred percent. Um, I loved all of that. No notes. No Thank notes. You. I mean, th- this book is part of why Remus is one of my favorite characters, and yes. I know people like to hate on this version of Remus, but it's awesome. Okay, it's, it's awesome and it's real. Of Remus. It's, it's so awesome. valid. 
And I, I love, I love that Harry calls him straight out. Like that interaction so is so perfect to me. Well, Jane, oh my God. Hello. Welcome in. Hello, Jane. And hello, baby Jane. How are you doing? <gasps> Jane had a oh my baby. Gosh. Yes. Jane, Jane, uh, Jane uh, popped her baby out the other day, by the way, guys. So, so cute. Uh, so that she, so now, now you know. Welcome, Jane. Welcome. So yes, char- the character development in this book is by far better than any of the other books if we had had this these sorts of things in some of the other books it could have elevated harry potter to be something that is not was not just like a cultural zeitgeist touchstone that like everyone loved in the moment but actually would stand the test of time to where people like were really studying you know harry potter and things like that if, if it would have been like this i believe that i believe that because like the thing is is that we've seen accurate character development with harry throughout the entire book series but none of the people around him have changed so the fact mm-hmm. that the other people around him are changing it just like we didn't even mention neville and Ginny and dean thomas and ted Tom. like there's all these vignettes of like small little glimpses of characters that we see how impacted by what is happening like affects them and we don't need to know the details because that effect makes so much sense yes it's so good it's It's so so good good. it's so good and there is one more thing in regards to these books that we just in general think is really good and that is something that we have said on several of these streams the action sequences in the writing okay rolling you're never gonna listen to this okay i know because we we bitch about you so much but just in case this message can ever reach you Girl, just in case stop you are listening. Fuck turfs. Anyway. Oh yeah, true. Fuck turfs. But okay, stop writing mysteries. Just be the Michael Bay of of like of of like literature. Just like you just need to be writing helicopters in the sunset. Okay, big explosions, chase scenes. Like these are good. Okay, they're so good, and there's so many in this book best moments of writing in this entire series in the entire series uh the only time that she's ever successfully built tension was in the fourth book but the mm-hmm. seat but the action scenes even in the fourth book book were better than that tension building in mm-hmm. this mm-hmm. let's talk about it let's talk about that chase scene over london let's talk about the uh death eaters coming in and snatching them both like threatening to snatch them at xenophilia's house but then also mm. in the woods mm. talking about the the uh escape through malfoy manor the final fucking battle ladies and gentlemen so good and also good. sets the tone there is an intensity in living in war that exists in these books and it makes the contrast of these action scenes so heavily packed with what is happening and the moments of stillness and loneliness that come with the isolation of the camping of being on the run that just makes the tone fantastic mm-hmm. i have never loved so jkr's good. writing more than in this book yeah because this is what she's truly good at It's like, and it it just, this book is just like action scene after action scene after action scene, right? Like we have, um, we have all the, what is it? Seven, whatever the, the zillions of Harry's, right? Yeah. Uh, That scene is so good. Okay. It's so good. Um, we have, uh, we have the really intense, like, it's not really an action scene, but it's like written that way where, um, Hermione and Harry go in and they meet Nagini who's like, you know, disguised, like, excellent scene like you said with the battle landon um the way that the wedding gets broken up that's gringotts. excellent the gringotts yeah oh my god the coal gringotts scene where they they after they sneak in and then they have to like rush back out on the back of a dragon like it's so cool well, and, and you like, don't know yeah. if that dragon's gonna drop them in the ocean like it might you we think have, it might <laughs> we have two heists that take place in this book. Yeah. we have the ministry heist and we have the gringotts heist all of them are written like action scenes with the tense feeling of action scenes there is no fear there is no mystery there is like the waiting for the shoe to drop sort of tension and it's so good because when the shoe drops she writes it out it's so good it's It's so so good. good i just i just want i just want more of that you know i i I feel like there is it's like so sad right it's so sad there is clearly an arrogance inside of her i mean obviously she became a turf so that there you know there is um that no one and i can't imagine that no one has ever told her girl your best scenes are your quidditch scenes do more of that like i can't i someone has told her someone has like 
come on. Um, there's no way that literally everyone around her is a complete, you know, sycophant that just tells her whatever she wants to hear. Like, I'm sure people give her real compliments, too. Like, that must exist. And and yet, and yet she is not known as, like, the Michael Bay of literature. But she should be. Okay, she should be. She should be writing mindless action with flimsy politics that don't make a lot of sense, but nobody gives a fuck because it's really fun and funny. And then she could be known as somebody that's like, wow, her writing really encapsulates like this time where the whole world is living in these kind of like liberal democracies. And they have like a very, um, you know, they have a, a very a childish notion of certain political things, but that makes a lot of sense for her, for her time. And, but you know, her writing is not really about that anyway. It's really about big explosions. So like nobody cares. Like and Matt, we could be saying those things about JK Rowling. We could be saying those things and like and like speaking about her in this very like um, this like loving, beautiful of her time way instead of like it all being mixed in with everything that we hate about her. Right. And and it's just it's very evident in this book is the thing. It's just it's so evident because you get chapter after chapter after chapter of this yes. and it's good. And it's it's yeah, there is a there is a thing there that is like really It makes it, it just, and then because of all of the like emotions towards JKR, but also all of the bullshit with the movie, this book gets lost. And that sucks. It, does. <laughs> it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't, it have doesn't to be. but it is. It is. Yeah. All right. So there is one other thing, a big thing in regards to this book that we actually think is really good. And that is the way that the beginning of the war is portrayed. So we have acknowledged many times that J.K. Rowling clearly didn't do any research. She doesn't understand how fascism comes about. She doesn't understand how Antifa organization organizing works. She doesn't understand that. But what she does understand is what the beginning of a fascist takeover looks like. Um, I find the depiction of this in this book very scary plenty accurate enough for me to buy into what's going on. And I'm going to give a couple of examples. We're going to start with my very, my, my first favorite example, the radio sequences. They're so good. I would read a whole appendix of just those radio sequences. I would, I find them so inspiring, so realistic, so heart wrenching, um, both in both the movie and the book. I love the radio sequences. They're excellent. Um, yeah, no, nothing bad to say about them. They're, they're good. Love them. I think they're, the radio sequences are so good. Also, like, the moments prior to the radio sequences, like, when they're waiting, when they're trying to find the code, when they're trying to do all that, I think that that is so good. Um, also, another thing that's done brilliantly is that we see the Ministry of Magic, uh, three times through the series we see it twice in the fifth book and once in this book and we see the difference of like like there's a metaphor there with the statue of for anyone who is who does not remember there's a statue in the ministry of magic that has uh, all of the magical beings so it could be centaurs creatures uh like different beings in general uh wizards amongst them like really like it's supposed to represent this thankfulness for the other creatures of the community that help support wizards basically is what this, the, the it's, purpose of it was. It's a, it's a propaganda piece it's to make you feel piece. like, uh, it make you feel like, okay, that there's slavery yes. in these because house elves are important too. hundred yes, percent <laughs> propaganda piece, but like it, I don't know if you've ever been to a government institution, but. Uh, oh yeah. But they're all like that. They're yeah, all like so, that. So this is like, yeah. mm -hmm. But that's the propaganda piece. Right. So we see that in the first time Harry's like, like this is a beautiful piece, blah, blah, blah. The second time the fountain is destroyed in a battle with between Voldemort and Dumbledore. Uh, things go sporting this way, go that way. We never see it fixed. Instead in the seventh book, we, it is now replaced with this statue of muggles and muggle-borns being crushed beneath the weight of wizard kind. Uh, and you can kind of see it in the back here uh, behind Dolores Umbridge and everyone like that, um, of like this crushing weight of that we are, we are better than all of these people. And like, there's an interesting 
metaphor that takes place there that is like so real of how subtle the government subtle quote unquote the government takeover can be that it's like it's the propaganda of a fountain in a ministry lobby and that's where it's at yeah and that's yeah, it's that's good. cool for like I'm like that's real that's so real because that that is the posters we have here in America that is the ads you're seeing everywhere it's the it's it's the way that speeches are formed on tv like that subtlety within the books is so good and so real that it, it just makes me so scared <laughs> Yeah, it's so good. And it's, and we're going to, and we are just going to, at the moment, we're going to put a pin yes. in this. We're going to tastefully ignore the fact that we get an epilogue where it's very clear that like absolutely nothing has changed. All the power structures that existed at the beginning of Harry Potter still exist um, that created Voldemort in the first place. But anyway, we're gonna put, put, put a little pin in that. We're going to talk about that next week. But the lead up to it, before we get to that ending and we see that actually uh jk rowling doesn't understand but it in the in this book before you get to that ending it is so good and it just it takes you on this journey it's like so breathtaking and it's so real and it's so yeah. like it it's good okay how, it's good <laughs> how they're rounding up and marking muggleborns mm. uh the the the, the court rumors, scene the court scene in general and then <sighs> also the rumors like the actual like we hadn't heard, we had heard blood supremacy. We had heard blood purity before. We had never heard the concept of Muggleborns stealing magic by stealing wands prior to this book. And that yep. is something that is the conspiracy theory that takes over in newspapers, in courtrooms, in things like that. And you're just sitting there and, and like, as someone obviously who read this the first time and was horrified by it but didn't have necessarily any context I was in eighth grade when this came out didn't necessarily have any context of how the world works outside of of eighth grade Landon but now as an adult sees those conspiracy theories existing in my newspapers existing in my news feeds like knowing that they're conspiracy theories, but also knowing that there are people in the world who do not think they are. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's terrified. the same thing. It's QAnon shit, right? It's like yeah. it's like that type of stuff. And it's um, the Antifa. And, yes, <laughs> like it's the, because like, Antifa exists, and we're meeting. Yeah, it's all, it's in all the like basement. oh. Oh, like, like um, and, yeah, and, but that's not, and that's not real. But like, <laughs> no, let's let's not. let's take, let's take a like a, let's take a specific example, okay? And we're gonna do we're gonna do one about trans people because we're talking about Harry Potter, okay? And that's so that's of right. course you know, turf sucks, suck, fuck turfs. Um, turfs. but okay, so here's like a good example, right? There's a there's a bunch of people that don't like don't like trans people, right? And so you hear about this, like, oh, trans people, blah, 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 they suck, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Okay. And so to get more people on board, they make up bullshit, like trans women in women's sports. Show me this. Show me these amazing trans women athletes. Where is trans Serena Williams? I've never met her. Okay. I've never heard of her. Okay. She doesn't exist. They're just regular athletes like any other female athletes. The bathroom bullshit. Oh, yeah. No one, no yeah. one is... No one is changing their entire gender just to have access to a, a specific public restroom. Guess what, you guys? This isn't Hogwarts in real life. You can just walk into the other gender's bathroom. You can just do that. You it can is, just do that. You can just, like, you're not changing your entire gender to walk into a bathroom that no one is guarding anyway. Like, yeah, but they they make this shit up, and it's the same thing as the the example of here yeah. of there like the the Muggleborns and half bloods and people stealing stealing and wands or not, whatever. And obviously, we're using trans as an example because this is uh the this is Harry Potter. But obviously, like th that happens with racism. That happened mm -hmm. with anti black rhetoric in America for as long as there has the, like for when the slave trade originally started here in America. Yeah. Uh, they just make I, stuff up. They just make stuff up. The idea of like Native Americans and and uh, and and people of like being like the term savages and un and uneducated, like mm -hmm. because they didn't because we didn't understand their culture. So there was this like we are just gonna call them this thing uh, to get people on our side to hate them to see them in a negative light. Yep. They just make stuff up. They just make stuff up. 
So and the, the, fact, the wand is a good example of that in, that happens and, in these books. Yes. And obviously like World War II is a big, like has a big impact on JKR. This story takes, has a lot of like representation of World War II and so does uh, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. So obviously like this is all tools that were also used in Nazi Germany and mm-hmm. ways that, that, that the fascists took control there too. Yeah. Um, they just made stuff up about people. They just, they just literally made just up. made stuff up. But the fact that it is so real and we're seeing it through a book in a way that isn't like because that's like that's the other thing too is I'm trying to think of revolutionary like YA novels where this is still a prevalent part Mm -hmm. and like the closest I can get is Hunger Games but even then it's not like this like there's no subtlety to it because in Hunger Games the fascists were already in control and had Mm -hmm. been forever yeah, right. that's they not really about a fascist uprising. That's more proper, of a, that's more about like um the fascist took over and now we have to dismantle it. Yeah. yeah. So like we don't we don't get to necessarily see the nuance of these situations and it's mm-hmm. so cool seeing it mm-hmm. play out and like feeling the recognition as an adult who's living in a real world watching it happen in a fantasy world. Mm-hmm. Yep. And to circle back to a little bit ago where we talked about uh, our favorite Remus Lupin. I think also a lot of the characters' reactions to the war are very mm-hmm. real in this book. So I'll give you give a couple of examples. How they're like, guys, let's have the wedding anyway. Okay. How many, how many people, okay, when faced with COVID, just had the wedding anyway? Okay. Yeah. There is a drive and a desire and a need for humanity to just keep going, even when we really shouldn't even when it's a bad idea and it's a bad idea to have the wedding, they get attacked. Right. So (laughs) should they have had it? Like, that's a very interesting question. And I think even Molly Weasley says something about that. Like she Mm -hmm. talks about how many young people got married and had babies. The first world, like the first world wizarding war because of that same idea of, Mm -hmm. well, life is going on. Might as well do it. Yeah. What's tomorrow going to bring? Let's, let's do what we want now. Let's do what we want now. And yeah. and it is like, that is obviously very accurate. There's, <laughs> oh, it's just, there's so many things that are, that are just, they hit the net, the nail on the head. Yeah. Um. A, another one of reactions is uh, a um, rounding up kids, getting onto the train, wizarding born mm-hmm. or muggle born kids getting onto the train. Mm-hmm. Um, the requirement of going to school school like as far as like being able to attend hogwarts has always kind of been willy-nilly there was been never really any defined rules of it there's been several talk about transferring like dick and malfoy drake and malfoy talked about transferring possibly um Mm -hmm. it seemed like there was a lot of in exchange like exchangeability between different schools and stuff like that yeah, schooling uh, seems very seems relative seems uh, normalized so that most kids do it but it's mostly optional yes there it is not optional like they have yeah. to they have to manipulate a ghoul in the Weasley house to make ron have a deadly to look at like ron had a deadly illness to excuse excuse him from being in school mm-hmm. like so that like requirement of kids going to school uh we saw several people on the run including ted tonks and dean thomas uh, doing very similar to the what Harry, Ron, and Hermione were doing, except they were doing it to survive rather than to fight a war. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And Ted, who was married, left in order to like protect his wife. Yeah. So it is all of these like little reactions to these side characters that build development, but also are make it feel so real. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, I just I really like it. It's it's really good. Mm-hmm. Oh, and also like Dolores Umbridge's grab for power. Oh, that's another one. Yes. Um, the way she's just like opportunity. Hello. Let me just and how many people when we had um Trump here it being the president in the US were all of a sudden like really interested in certain things that they had never been interested in before. Wasn't that interesting? Um, I'm not going to name any names because I don't like to name too many names on this stream, but whoever just popped into your head, that's who I'm thinking of. Okay. Um, there were multiple of them. There were multiple of them, multiple Dolores Umbridges. And talk about a self insert character without realizing it's a self insert character, oh. Dolores Umbridge. Uh, 
I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Out of anybody who's a turf in the Harry Potter world, she's canonically a turf. Canonically. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, mm -hmm. (laughs) Sorry. Sorry, Joanne. You wrote yourself the villain. You wrote yourself as the villain. You wanted to be a Hermione. You're a Dolores Umbridge. Mm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So we have talked for about the past like 30, 40 minutes about like things that we really loved in in this particular book. Um, but don't you guys worry. This is a, a interstage window Harry Potter stream. It's not going to all be about the things that we liked. All right. Oh, uh, <laughs> the first. <laughs> We're going to do an Audible recommendation. Mm-hmm. Uh, Audible, we've been partnered with Audible for quite a while. Um, audibletrial.com slash interstage window. You can get a free audio book. It helps support mm-hmm. the stream. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a great way to access reading. I don't know how many people I've had to tell this in the last few weeks, but listening to audiobooks is reading. Mm-hmm. If you mm-hmm. like to read audiobooks and you like to listen to audiobooks, it's reading. Just because you're not reading the physical book doesn't mean you're not engaging in the story and you're not consuming literature. Reading is consuming literature. It's not the act of actually like physically reading the words. You're still because engaging with, well, you're still engaging with written prose. Even yes. you're just not doing it with your eyeballs. That's all. And that's fine. That's good. So mm-hmm. if you would like to read more, but perhaps you're too busy or you have a long drive, this is a great way to consume books and stay on task with everything. Oh, sorry. Oh. I apparently hit the thing that wasn't meant to be hit. There we go. Okay, we're back. <laughs> so, uh, every every time we do a media stream, I have a recommendation. And this week's recommendation is The Lord of Shadows. There's also The Lady Midnight. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a duo, duology of, by Cassandra Clare, who I've talked about on here prior. She started as a Harry Potter fan fiction writer, moved on to the City of Bones, and she now has invented this supernatural urban fantasy world, very similar to Harry Potter that exists underneath the non-magic people uh so you have things like you know fairies and we, uh the fae and uh werewolves and vampires and all that lovely lore that exists in these uh urban cities uh fighting demons and this one just happens to include a corrupt governmental system uh that two teens are suffering under while also trying to take care of their family and siblings and save the world Wow. That's a lot of fun. Oh my gosh. That sounds so good. You guys should get it. You can totally get it um, on Audible. So you go to audibletrial.com slash interstage window, start your 30 day free trial. You can cancel after that and still help out the stream. So don't worry if you do want to read just this book, that is okay. You can do that. Um, But I really like Audible and I do recommend (laughs) the service in general. Um, Mm -hmm. As somebody who is very busy and a bit of a slow reader, audiobooks are my key to actually reading the way that I used to when I was a kid and had free time, which doesn't happen now as an adult. (laughs) And before we move from this, I would like to do one more little shout out thingy. Um, This stream is is also sponsored by me. Um, We have a merch shop now, you guys. You can find it on Etsy, etsy.com slash shop slash it's Karen Terry. We have sticker packs for both my um, artistic license stream as well as interstage window. So if you'd like to get some interstage window stickers, you can put those on all the things. You can put them on water bottles. You can put them on your notebooks. You can put them on your laptop. You can put them on your face. They go great in all the areas. Um, Also, please like that shop. Do, Do the little follow shop thing because... Uh, As you guys know, uh, I do a lot of like crafty things, like I make a lot of things. And so there will be more stuff posted here. Like I'm I'm learning right now. I'm I'm practicing making. I show you. I need Karen to commission me something. There we go. Here we go. I'm making. (laughs) I've been um I've been practicing making slimes. Okay, (gasps) so I started this a couple of years ago, but I've been really putting it like this is a buttery slime. Oh, look at how like smooth that is. Slime. It's called a butter slime. Ooh. So we are going to be doing the the slime stream that I promised you guys when we hit 300 in December. So um, I'll show you some more about that, but I'll probably po- be posting some of these to Etsy because I can't have a hundred slimes sitting around my house. <laughs> so uh, Levi, Levi would not appreciate that. 
<laughs> I think I think he would be a little concerned when um, my crafting escaped my room and started yeah. invading the rest of the house. There, we we might have to have a conversation about that. <laughs> like, what the heck, Karen? We just yeah. moved. Come on, now. <laughs> can so so yeah. There will be some of those popping up on my Etsy shop. So if you like uh, resin crafts, if you like uh, handmade crafts, then um, definitely follow as well there because those will be posted there as well as our merch. Karen is incredibly talented. Go follow. Oh, thank you. All right. So yes, two two kind of sponsors today. All right. What's next, Landon? What are we talking about next? What's happening at Hogwarts? What's happening at Hogwarts? So this is like the one thing, movie, but also book, understanding that Harry Potter has been told in a omniscient, not omniscient, in a limited light. So very quickly so sorry i'm gonna go all teacher on on people's asses uh different points of view are different kinds of stories there's third person point of view which means that the story is told from a character uh in the book and you're kind of like watching a movie but there's two different kinds there's third person omniscient which means you're inside everybody's head and there's third person limited which means you're stuck to with one or multiple characters to point depending on who's like narrating Harry Potter has always been told from just Harry's point of view, which is how we get those like mean things about Hermione and the not great things about Ron. Um, and then we'd get like a sprinkling of random chapters, yeah. like from Voldemort's perspective or, st- or stuff and, like but that. Mostly, but for the most but part, it's that, Harry. Yeah. So typically the first chapter of the later books after the fourth or fourth and on is from a different person's point of view. But for the most part, it's Harry. And even those chapters, for the most part, are through Harry's eyes as like is, is a dream Harry is having. So realistically, it would not follow the world to know what was happening at Hogwarts through another person's perspective. Mm -hmm. However, we know so much of what is happening around the world because of radio, because of newspapers, because of the life and lives of Alice Dumbledore. And yes, we wanted to be taken from Hogwarts in order to hear the story, but we're taken so far out of Hogwarts that we don't know what's happening at Hogwarts until we get there. And that is something that just didn't like yeah um this is really a note for the movie more than the book i'm not sure how you would fix this with the book but we get this like tiny little scene in the movie where it's towards the beginning and it's and it's basically depicting that they are taking kids off of the train like they're not letting muggle-born kids get on the train and they're just snatching them up right and the the dude like comes on the train and they're looking for people and neville stands up to him all like you know proud and tall because that guy is super tall and um and he's like what the fuck um i don't remember what the line he says but that's basically what happens it's like a it's like a two minute scene okay the movie should have had more of that i want to know what Neville and Luna and Ginny are doing at Hogwarts. They're clearly doing some cool things. We know this because in the book, when Harry does finally come back to Hogwarts and they're about to have the Battle of Hogwarts and all of this, like he is told this, right? He has a lot of interactions with Luna and Neville in particular, right? Where he where he learns like what they have been doing and, and how they've been preparing and how um how now that he's here, they can execute all these these things that they've been working on. And they're so excited, right? Um and The movie could have totally written scenes for Neville where we see what Neville and Luna and Ginny are all doing, what the DA is doing and and what is what the actual like terror that um, the Caro twins are enacting on the school, which we only get a tiny little bit of in the books. And the thing is, is like the the movies have certain things like so stretched out that I feel like they could have made a, a movie that felt as fast paced as the book if they would have simply spliced in maybe maybe like three more scenes, okay? Like maybe two more in the first movie and one more at the beginning of the second movie before Harry, Hermione, and Ron arrive back at Hogwarts where it follows like Neville around with what the heck's going on with them there. And I think that would have solved a lot of what makes the movie feel so sluggish, especially the first movie. And I also, I think that there are ways to do this in the book. It it just needs to be subtle the same way that we're learning about how the wizarding world is reacting. Mm -hmm. Like, um, we don't know about them pulling people like and muggle-borns until, I want to say Easter break. And I think that Luna says it. Um, But like we run into Dean before that. 
Uh, and Harry and Dean and never have a conversation, but we're overhearing Dean talking to Ted. There could have been something subtle about like, they started pulling kids off and I ran, mm -hmm. right? Like something like that. Or even um, like we have so many scenes of, or we only have like one scene of Harry looking at the map, thinking about Ginny. And like, that's a perfect opportunity to watch an interaction happen. Even if we don't know what's happening, there can be an, there can be a subtlety of like watching her and the DA meet fighting, like fighting off a first year or something. Like there could have been subtle little things here that would have made it like connect more to Hogwarts. Mm -hmm. Because, because we, we know it happens. We like, we swam in the right direction. We just swing so far in the right direction that it really does feel disconnected from Hogwarts um until we're there mm -hmm. and it's like oh no hey, no we gotta we gotta keep that connection at least a little bit especially because we have characters like neville and the da that we love and we want to know what's happening to them like i know they're secondary characters but we still want to know like there was a huge fandom um you know around a lot of these minor characters in in the in the books and um and i think that could have been recognized a lot better by like inserting a few scenes of what was happening at Hogwarts somehow. I agree. And the movie would have been so much better if they had done oh, that. Oh, yeah. They, they already started. They had already started doing that. Yeah, like they have they have the one tiny little scene and it's like, oh, there it is, the idea. This is a good idea. Let's do more of this. But they don't. They don't do more of it. Let's do the idea. Yeah, and again, being able to see the horror of the torture of being able to see... Mm -hmm. Like the, the, like it's very clear that there's so much pain going on there at Hogwarts. Like we see um, the Caro twins interacting um, as professors in the mode of like punishing students. Like right, like we see that, and well, so we know that all of this stuff is going on. But it would have been cool, I think, to see like how that affects the kids and how they continue with the the DA and how that inspires them to continue with the DA. Um, as kind of like, oh, there's uprisings happening all over. Yeah. And I mean, also like we miss out. We learn so much about Severus Snape mm -hmm. through his post-death actions than any sort of hints of his pre-death actions. Mm -hmm. At this point in time, we are convinced, like as fans, when this first came out, we're convinced Snape is evil. We're convinced that um, he killed Dumbledore, that there is, that he's not helping out at all. I would have loved to see some, something either like expanding that even more, showing that even more that then is later explained post as to like him actually helping in a way, kind of like the Doe Patronus, or some ways that are not like, that are subtle fights. Just mm -hmm. even if it's subtle. Yep, because the Patronus thing can easily be explained in, in the sense of like, oh, well, on one hand, he kind of had to do that because of the unbreakable vow that he made. Like, he kind of had to help well, out Harry at least a little bit. Yeah, well. You know, so. He didn't, he didn't make an unbreakable vow for Harry. Oh, that's right. He made the unbreakable vow for Draco. For but, Draco. Um, and Draco, yeah. the, 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 his unbreakable vow at that point had already been met because it was yep. finish the job that Draco can't do, which is yep. kill Dumbledore. You're so right. But it's kind has... of like, it's kind of like he's helping Harry because of Lily, right? Yeah. And we know that he's also at the same time, the headmaster of Hogwarts, and he's allowing the Caro twins to wreak all their, of their havoc. So he's, and he's still acting as a double agent. So like he has to hide somewhat but it would have been nice to see some of that reality. You know what I mean? Uh, in regards to what was going on at Hogwarts. You know, how is he actually handling that? And uh, and we don't know because Harry's not there. And it would have it would have been nice. And I think it would have really added to like the punch gut that we're supposed to feel when we find yeah. out that Snape was good all along. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that I think brings us to our next thing. Mm hmm my which favorite, is my favorite subject to talk about <laughs> snilly <laughs> uh so as you guys know um from previous episodes uh landon is a snilly hater okay i'm not a she's, snilly hater i'm she's just a, anti -snilly. She that snilly haterade 
Yeah, I'm I'm not a snilly hater. I'm just anti snilly. Okay. Anyways. There's a difference. I'm not gonna sit there and be like you're a deprived, terrible human being if you ship snilly, but I am gonna be like, man, Snape sucks. Will you know what? But that's what anti means nowadays. <laughs> anti means like I will harass you for this ship. So oh, I will harass you for this ship. What? No. Uh- <laughs> no harassing for ships. But anyway, all I'm trying to say is like Landon drinks the snilly hater aid, but the books do not. Okay, the books do not like J.K. Rowling likes to pretend like she's like, I don't know why people like Snape. She knows why people like Snape. Okay, like she likes Snape, too. Like, like, don't be stupid. Like, I read the book. She's she loves she's a Snape lover. Okay, she does. She thinks she thinks Albus Dumbledore didn't do anything wrong. It was the perfect leader for the wizarding world. And that Snape was a great guy. Mm. Stand up. A plus. Mm -hmm. Apparently, your actions don't matter. The only thing that matters is if in your heart you uh, continue to love Someone you fell in love with as a child. He's That's just, what makes you a good person. He's just such a... What are those guys? I'm. Oh, what are those guys? Uh, those guys that uh, don't... What is it called when like they hate women? and Misogynist. No, no. I know that one. They're, <laughs> troll, they're trolls on the internet who hate oh, women. Oh, you're talking about incels. 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 Yeah, Snape's an, an incel. incel. He's such Snape's an, an incel. incel. Uh, he just... Okay. By the way, I put this on here for us to talk about. So we don't we don't have to be like Landon doesn't want to talk about it. We have to talk about it. The snilly, we the always and forever. It. Yeah. Truly, truly love story of it. Turns out there's been this thing all along that Snape and Lily have known each other from childhood, that Snape loved her from afar. Uh, and 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 worship the ground that she walked on, and that they understood each other because Snape comes from an abused family household, and Lily, as soon as she found out she was magical, was shunned by her sister. So they both come from this place of abandonment and feeling outsiders of their own family and misunderstood, and so they they can love each other. And as they grow up, Lily really cares about Snape and Snape falls in love with Lily, but he never, as far as we're aware, tells her that he's in love with her and instead just starts hanging out with anti muggle born people that want her dead and abuse her (laughs) and then use racist (laughs) rhetoric and language against her when, because a boy, a different boy likes her that she doesn't like and then is like, but why you no love me? And then, and then gives information to the ant to the to the to the big person, the big Kahuna who wants to kill all Muggleborns. Gives information that leads that man to killing. The woman that he loves, because again, he's anti-Muggleborn team, but loves this Muggleborn, uh, <laughs> gives information that leads to her death and then goes to the other guy who's in charge and is like, actually, it's not because I realized that I'm racist or that I'm a terrible human being. It actually just turns out that uh, I don't want this woman to die. So please help me. And then Dumbledore is like, Sorry, she's dead, but her son is going to be alive and you can help abuse him. It is an already abusive situation. Yeah. So what I'm saying, what I, what I would like to say is, because I, I love Snape. Okay. Like I was there when Snape Wives was a thing. Yes. I read that, that live journal community. Yes. I joined it. No, I never posted, but I, I was there. Okay. I was there. And here's the deal. Here's the deal. This just shows J.K. Rowling's complete lack of creativity. Because so why bad. does why does Snape do what he does? Why does Snape feel like he feels? Why does why does Snape why does it, this happen to Snape? Right? This happens to Snape because Slytherin exists. Guess what still exists in the epilogue? Slytherin. Slytherin still exists in the epilogue. Why? 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 Why are we taking all of the racists and putting them in 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 one pod together? All it does is create more racists. That's all that does. Why? Dumb. He had here's here's the very why I'm anti Snape. He has so much potential. Mm-hmm. On every 
on every checklist. Mm-hmm. I should love this man. I mean, he's he's like Morally he's like a, a quintessential Tumblr sexy man. Morally gray, sexy, just would do dubious things, mm-hmm. like willing to burn down the world for one woman. I'm just saying that this is like. He is Spike or Damon Targaryen or any Klaus Michelson, but in a different font. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I can't stand him because the writer decided to just like ooh woo him to the extreme. And then pretended that all of the stuff he did didn't matter. That it's no, really silly. Beca- because he loved her. He wasn't a bad guy. He didn't get her killed. He didn't emotionally manipulate and torture her son. He saved him. And here's the thing. We're going to name a child after him. Uh, (laughs) Because here's here's the thing about that. She could think that all she wants. And I would 100% support her because like hard agree, you know. But there's no way that Harry thinks that. There's just no way. He doesn't think that. He doesn't. He does. Because he named a child after him. The bravest man he ever met. The two bravest men he ever met. It takes a lot of bravery to abuse children for decades, doesn't it? But guess what? Or a decade, I guess. Named his son after two of the people who abused the most children in this entire book series. Why his other son wasn't called Dudley or Vernon, I will never know. Because they did the same exact bullshit. Dudley, Vernon, Potter. (laughs) Mystery third child. (laughs) Named after the third and fourth (laughs) bravest men I've ever known. (laughs) This this is my OC. Okay, this is my OC. Dudley Vernon. Vernon Potter. Vernon Potter. Potter. Yeah. Named after the third and fourth most <laughs> bravest men I ever knew. <laughs> this is my OC. James, James Potter over here having... James Potter... James Serious Potter. Sorry, there are multiple of them. Uh-huh. James Serious Potter over here being like, what the, what the fuck did I... I... <laughs> James Potter from heaven sitting up there and losing his goddamn mind. (laughs) Oh my God. Oh my God. Harry, your daddy issues are showing (laughs) (laughs) because you're just like the men that abused me are brave. Oh my God. They're so brave. Okay. Um, I got, wait, what's this guy's name? The face claim for this OC is Ian Somerhalder, a young Ian Somerhalder. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, Young Ian Somerhalder is the, is the face claim for this (gasps) OC. (laughs) <laughs> uh, how see and that's so funny because my albus my albus severus is choice of odd and i don't understand how those two are related but it makes sense in my head <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so like okay i really love snape he was a favorite character from the beginning he only became more favorite when it, it was alan rickman playing him in the movie like i love him but even as like i said somebody that was there during the Snape Wives Live Journal, that read all the all those things, okay, that was constantly seeking out Snape fix, Snape anybody, really. But a lot of, if you look for Snape, you find Snilly, whether you want Snilly or you don't want Snilly. That's just kind of how it is, okay, you guys, that's just how it is. Um, and uh, and I I still was angry that Harry named his child after Snape. It makes no sense. Okay, it makes no sense. I I don't understand it at all. I think that the other part about this whole thing that really upsets me is that Snape never ever changes his mind throughout his adulthood, even after Lily dies. I totally agree with everything that happens up until Lily's death. And even if Snape were to have a mourning period after that for his character, but like at some point, yes, adults move on. I, I, you know what? That is the thing. That is the thing. Cause you're a hundred percent right. If, sorry, I'll let you continue, but he doesn't even have to move on romantically, to be honest. He could decide like, 
you know what? Maybe I was super in love with Lily. This this situation has given me some trauma. Um, I'm going to live a, a more um, aromantic sort of life at this point due to this experience that I have had, right? Maybe he chooses, he, ch- he, he actually chooses a celibacy, right? Maybe he decides this. Um, but I don't agree with like his Patronus remaining a doe. I don't agree with the always speech. He just, there's no reason that this character has to continue through adulthood 18 years later with this delusion. I would, by 18 years, he could say like, I did love her and I have like helped out and continued to be a double agent because of her, but she doesn't define my entire life. Yeah. Well, and I, I also think that there's a level there that you could, like, if we really wanted that connection to still be a huge part of his life, mm-hmm. I think that there's a way you could do it. The guilt of realizing that his actions is what ended up killing her and that mm-hmm. he did love her and that guilt stays with him. And those mem- memories and moments with her are the things that bring him happiness still. Do Patronus, absolutely. There's a change and reflection on his actions that continue to have him working for Dumbledore without this like possibility of Lily would love me. Um, and I think what that would also do is prove that like his ideology changed because his ideology didn't change at this no, point. No, it didn't. There, no, it he's didn't. Still, he is still the man who agreed with anti-Muggle-born rhetoric, mm-hmm. who joined a hate group, mm-hmm. actively participated in the murder and torture of people of a certain dominion that the person he supposedly loved was a part of, and then continued those beliefs and brought them into their teaching. And we're supposed to believe that he's a good guy. You know what bothers me about this the most is this is hard and fast proof that none of this was planned. No, Harry Potter wasn't planned because Snape as a character was introduced because it's a, it's a, it's a good trope for character development and for progress in the plot to have a teacher that bullies and abuses the students. It just is. Okay. That's why you see it over and over. And that's, that's Snape. Okay. And all of this other stuff was added later. All of this other stuff was added later. And I would even be okay with like, it doesn't have to be planned the first one right yeah awesome but start laying the steps start realizing start laying the steps of harry realizing that his original and initial opinion of snape was wrong or Mm -hmm. not always accurate Mm -hmm. and we kind of get that half-assed in the first one but not really no No. uh and then because snape continues to abuse harry in, in the rest of the books yeah, exactly. And continues all the way up until he dies. Yeah. That is not what pisses me off the most. What pisses me off the most is that JKR believes this. Mm-hmm. That she will, and I know this is not a fandom episode, but she will go on a soapbox talking about how those who are attracted to Draco Malfoy or believe in Draco Malfoy's redemption Um, obviously didn't read the books, got it all wrong, and she doesn't understand how they can think that, but waves the flag, rolls out the red carpet, and says Snape is a hero. Mm -hmm. How she truly does not see that she has written an incredibly flawed character and is presenting him in the same way that she presents Dumbledore in an inaccurate light of what she has actually written. Yeah. Just and lack of imagination. Because lack of imagination. Well, yeah, and it's also because that like people who are not going to read into it don't know. And I'm not saying that you have to read everything to read into it, right? But like, I will never understand somebody who comes out the other side and says Snape was the hero. Mm-hmm. I'm like, you didn't yep. read the books then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You I've fell, never understood you it. fell down the rabbit hole. You fell down the trap that JKR didn't even try to write well. <laughs> yeah. Like the whole Snape is a hero thing, like, and Harry names a kid after him. Like, to me, that is like, that didn't happen in the book. Some fan wrote that. Like, that's how it she, feels. Yeah. That's how it feels. She, but no, that actually happens in the books. 
she expects the main character to believe that and and, yeah. to, and gives us no reason for us to think that that's believable and then she mm-hmm. also expects the fans to believe that mm-hmm. and gives us no reason to make it believable i am a hundred percent on board for snape's plot line all the way up until lily dies but the mm-hmm. fact that there was absolutely no change in the consequence of his actions, that his actions consequences was that he went to Dumbledore begging for his help and then never actually truly believed the ideology of the change, never actually had personal character growth. That's where you lost me. That's where mm-hmm. you lost me with this character. Mm-hmm. If he was just a mean teacher with a terrible past and shouldn't be around kids, but had to be because of the agreement, cool. But the fact that he... It was unchanged forever. Mm-mm. Nope. Hate it. Hate him. I could I could write Snape better. I could write Snape better. You ha- yes. I, I think I personally think one of the 12 year olds I teach could write Snape better. <laughs> I have several. I have names. If someone wants them, <laughs> I will not give them to you because that's illegal. But <laughs> I have names of people that I think could write Snape better. Yeah, for sure. For sure. <laughs> So yes, um, we couldn't talk about this book without revisiting Snilly. We um, had a, a deep dive on Snape whenever we had uh, talked about the very first book because he is such a big part of that first book. And um, and we've come full circle. Okay, we've come back. We've there's come so back much, to Snape at the end. There's so much change and so much non-change. There's yes. information we get about Snape without the character actually changing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like <laughs> we, we, hear, we hear in the narrative, we learn more about Snape. And none of what we learn actually affects his actions no, at nothing, all. Nothing or actually explains changes them. anything. Yeah, it's like one of those things where it's like, I was like, we didn't have to d- die of it. Like, I get why, I get, I guess, get why the like pensive and memories and stuff like that happened. Mm-hmm. But I'm like, the only one that actually ever mattered was where Dumbledore admitted to raising Harry to eventually kill himself. Mm. And that he has a horcrux <laughs> inside himself. Like that's the that's literally the oh, that's the only one that matters. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we have this ama- we have this chapter full of like Snape and Lily and this and that and love and blah blah blah. And it's like I don't fucking mm-hmm. care. That's mm-hmm. not the only thing that matters is that Harry Harry's walking away from this conversation not because Snape changed his mind, even though that's what it makes it sound like it is, but because. It turns out that he has to kill himself. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, Snilly. <laughs> so fun. Uh, okay. Did this story resonate with you? <laughs> okay. So we have come to the end of this particular episode. We are going to do a part two on it, but um, we wanted to go ahead and talk a little bit about uh, in this first episode this question. So did it resonate? This book, I have to say, as an adult, resonates with me a lot more than it did as a kid. Um, There's things I can appreciate about it so much more rereading it as an adult. I feel like what makes this book fall flat in a lot of areas has nothing to do with this book, but it has to do with everything leading up to it. It's like, ah. There's so many cool things here. I wish they would have had more set up. So in some ways, yes, this book resonates with me quite a lot. In other ways, not so much, which is why when we talk about this series, I say things like, oh, the fourth book is my favorite, right? Or the third book is my favorite. Like I talk about the third and the fourth book as my favorite ones, as well as like the objectively best book in the series. And even though there is in this book that has the most um, high quality prose, I can't rank it up there with the third and fourth books because this is the book of payoff. And there are certain things that just didn't have enough set up in the previous books for me to feel how this book should make me feel. So a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B with Deathly Hallows. So yeah, yeah. So Landon, what about you? Does Deathly Hollows resonate? Yeah, I think it does. I think that um, especially the things that some of the things that we've talked about uh, as far as like the building of a war um, as a writer, there's a lot of stuff in here and then and the small nuance of certain things and the way characters react to 
a, a war and a shift in political power that I take away as a writer. And then I'm also taking away as an adult woman watching fascism exist in my world. Mm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that like being able to see the themes and the connections, uh, I think both helped me as a kid growing up, being able to see them faster and understand them. Mm. And also now as an adult to sit there and be like, okay, this is, this is what's going to happen because I got to tell you what's happening is out of a book. Like <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's there. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. So I think that, yes, it resonates in a lot of ways. I agree with you as far as like, I forget how good this book is. Uh, so I've always said six is my favorite. Third is a very close second. Fourth is up there. This is also up there, mm-hmm. but because of the lack of payoff, because of how it ends, that epilogue really did ruin so much. Oh uh, my God. And I don't even think we are talking about a huge number of the epilogue next time. Yeah, uh, no, we are. Just, we are. We do, we do, we do, we do. Okay. Yeah, we are. Okay. So thank you so much for joining us, everybody. Let's talk about what we're gonna let's let's talk a little bit about what's coming next. Okay. So next week here, this Twitch channel on Saturday, we are gonna be talking about part two. We're gonna be doing part two of our Deathly Hollow stream. What are we gonna be doing? You can see in the title here. Deathly MacGuffins. We're going to be talking about all of the magical objects and what that means for the story. We're going to be talking about Horcruxes, okay? And the reason why the resonation was here, does it resonate was here instead of in the next episodes? Because the last segment of the next one we know is going to drag on. Because guess what? That's where our Spot the Problem segment is going, okay? You didn't see Spot the Problems this week. You didn't see Spot the Problems next week because it's happening next, this week because it's happening next week, okay? And uh, yes, that includes the epilogue, okay? So... That's what we're doing. That's where you can find us. Um, please follow uh, to catch that episode. Also, Artistic License has moved to Sunday. Okay, so we did not stream on Thursday. I'm going to be streaming tomorrow at noon, and we are returning to Final Fantasy X. My goal is to finish Final Fantasy X by the end of this year. We have got a few of the Dark Aeons left to beat. Okay, so we're going to be working on the Maga Sisters. Um, Dark Bahamut and Dark Anima. We're going to try to beat those tomorrow. Um, I'm trying to 100% Final Fantasy X. <laughs> so uh, so we're getting really close. I think I can do it by the end of the year. Welcome in, Alpha Tiff. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and as always, you can find all of my VODs on my YouTube channel. So here we go. Let me post in my socials. Socials. Uh... So if you would like to watch any of our over 24 hours of Harry Potter content, you can find it on my YouTube channel. All right. You can also follow my Twitter. Um, I don't know. Uh, We'll see. We'll see how much longer my Twitter exists. Elon Musk is very quickly killing Twitter. Uh, I can talk about that in a second because I I, I do have something I want to show you guys. Not related to Harry Potter or anything. It's just upsetting me. So I want to I want to show you. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you can follow me on Twitter. That's where you get all the latest updates for what's going on with my stream. If there's, um, that's where I say like what I'm streaming about. That's where, um, you can see if there's any like changes or things like that. So you want to be following my Twitter. Also, you want to be following my discord because that's where you can get notifications. I actually control the notifications in there. So we don't trust Twitch and YouTube to necessarily notify you all the time, but you can join my discord and you can trust that because I can actually control them in there. So that's all the places that you can find me. Um, Landon, where can everybody find you? Uh, you can find me on my Instagram at Land in Maine. It's a pun. You can also find me on Twitter if I don't also leave the site. Uh, mm-hmm. There's a TikTok out there somewhere. Don't know. No. It's in the atmosphere. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and you can find me here next Saturday talking about more Harry Potter. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So um, mm, here's the thing I have to show you guys. Okay. Elon Musk is already destroying Twitter. And this has nothing to do with the stream. I just I just want to complain. Okay. No, do it. Complain. Let's, whatever. Okay. Thank you guys for staying for my extra little segment. Let's switch back to webcam only so you can see this big. Okay. So I tweeted, um, because I've had a couple of people, I've had three people message me so far. My Instagram got hacked. 
I don't care because Instagram is dying. I'm not going to go fix it. Like I'm whatever. It's whatever. It's it, it means that I shouldn't I don't log on to Instagram anymore if it's hacked. Whatever. That's fine. So because I've had multiple people contact me, I was like, oh, let me update my Twitter. So here we go. This is where I post. My Instagram is hacked. Sorry, I'm not fixing it. Look at this down at the bottom. All these hidden replies. This is about a zillion. Okay, let me just scroll. This is like so many bots. I just posted this this morning. I never oh get this God. much engagement. It's just bots after bots after bots. Look, all and they're all talking about how they can help me recover it. Look, look, uh, they're in my DMs. They're in my DMs. It like, it won't stop. It won't. He fired, he fired a bunch of engineers that are, that make the site do the things the site is supposed to do. And, and he fired them. And now my tiny account is being overrun by bots. I had to meet, I'm going to have to mute. I'm going to have to mute that post because it, it, I keep getting notifications. I keep getting notifications and none of them are people. I don't do that. Okay. I don't mute things on there. I don't have enough engagement to care. I want to see when you guys engage with my tweets, when you like them and comment and retweet and things like that. I don't want to mute my tweets, but there's like a zillion bots responding to that tweet. It's I'm so mad, you guys. I'm so mad at Aramine Muskrat right now. I just can't. I just can't. <sighs> anyway. Um, yeah, so I wanted to show you that. Join us on AO3. <laughs> 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 soon the, moving to soon moving to pillow fort uh, inner stage window advertisements oh i don't know what i'm gonna do like like i haven't been on facebook since the beginning of the pandemic facebook is dead instagram has been slowly dying throughout the pandemic like i don't care about it anymore it's all ads i can't find proper engagement on there twitter's the last one where i actually see a decent amount TikTok. of the content i want to see yeah i'm gonna have to go to tiktok you guys like i'm gonna have to be like i'm gonna have to be like TikTok. going live on twitch right now guys like as a TikTok, that's the only one. What's left? What the heck is? Le- I don't even know. I don't even know. It's Hell World. We're in Hell World. I don't. Whatever. I'm so upset. Karen. Yes. Your millennial is showing. The internet's dead, you guys. <laughs> the internet's dead. First of all, that is a big claim. <laughs> it's not dead. It's just changing. They're trying to kill it. They are trying. Okay. They are trying to kill it. I don't want this. I don't want this. Okay. Well, we can have we can have Moisty go back on, and he can talk <laughs> about the death of the internet with you, and I'll just sit here and laugh. I'm so annoyed. I'm so annoyed. Anyway, I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Karen's anyway, favorite, Karen's favorite social media is dying, and she's very upset by it. <sighs> but it's not even my favorite. I'm there because all the rest of them that I liked died. What's your current favorite then? Well, yeah, because I was forced and now it's going to be dead too. Anyway, whatever. I don't know if Instagram is dying. It, I, mine's like full of ads. I never see who who I actually follow on there and I haven't for months. So getting hacked, it's like, okay, I just won't log into it anymore. It's fine. It doesn't matter. Yeah, I haven't I used have it properly I, in forever. I was one of those three people. So I yeah. was like, hey, Karen, just so you know, <laughs> you're posting yeah. about EFTs. <laughs> Yeah. No, uh, no NFTs. I had NFT spam. Yeah. An, an NFT seller is who took my account. And they keep posting about NFTs. If you ever see me post about NFTs and it's not a shit post, like it looks like a legit post. It's not me. I promise you. I would only ever shit post about NFTs. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that's our stream. You guys, thank you so much for watching to the end. Let's, 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 uh, let's find someone to rate. Let's find someone. To rate. We went <laughs> off the rails. That's yeah. what just happened. Off we're going to raid out to my friend. Yes. We're going to raid out to my friend Shady Joker because he is hosting a raid train that I'm going to participate in in January. Um, he's a he's a quite larger stream than me, but he is very good. If you like my streams, I think you would like his too. He's got really good vibes. Uh, so that's who we're going to raid into. Um, so yeah. Thank you guys so much for watching today. I hope you enjoyed the show. And of course, as always, don't forget to make it a great day. And don't forget to be awesome. All right. See you guys tomorrow. Goodbye.